Hello, everyone. Welcome to Podcasting 101. In this video, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know to make your own podcast. So at this point, you might be asking yourself, wait, who are you? Well, that's a good question, because there's a lot of information about podcasts out there, and it's hard to know what's good advice and what isn't. So my name is Catherine. I'm the reference librarian at the North Situate Library. But also, I'm a podcaster who has been making shows with my friends for about five years. If you want to look me up, I usually go by Theron online. The biggest projects I've been involved in are Roll Like a Girl, which is a D&D 5th edition actual play podcast with an all-women and non-binary cast, and Interference, an audio drama about space-crossed lovers. I do other things too, but really Roll Like a Girl is my claim to fame. We've received nearly 150,000 downloads since 2017 and have a steady listener base, even after a hiatus that has lasted through the entire pandemic. Anyway, the important factor lying at the center of these two pieces of my identity, podcaster and librarian, is that I know a lot about creating an indie podcast, and I love teaching people stuff for free. So buckle up for Podcasting 101. To make sure we're on the same page, I'm going to start with a brief talk about what a podcast even is. Then we'll move into the nuts and bolts of making it, getting an idea for your show, deciding on how each episode will look, and finding people to be on it, as well as figuring out a logo. I'll talk about the recording process and discuss the kind of equipment you need, and give a quick overview of editing and publishing options. Finally, we'll talk a little bit about marketing and community management. This video is designed to be a quick overview of the topic. When I was prepping this, I realized I could honestly do an entire lesson on a lot of the concepts that we're going to discuss. I could do a whole lesson just on logos. I could definitely talk for a long time about editing, marketing, community building, or how to learn from your mistakes. Uh, so if you want an in-depth class on any of those things, I can make them. To be honest, I may not be the best person to talk to about marketing because I have very small dreams, but nevertheless, I'm happy to share what I've learned. If you're looking for more insights, Barrington and Warwick Public Libraries are doing a big series on podcasting this summer with all sorts of amazing guests. I'll put the link to their registration page in the description box for you, and I'll also have a link to my slides for this presentation. I will have a big collection of resource links towards the end for podcasters and consultants in my community and the wider internet. So first, what is a podcast? The simple answer is that it's a digital sound recording that you can download onto your mobile device or computer to listen to via an RSS feed. Why are they called podcasts? Well, back in the dark ages of the internet, the first shows of this style were broadcast onto people's iPods. And to be honest, I'm surprised the name stuck, but I doubt we'll change it up at this point. Now, you probably noticed that definition is extremely vague, and that's because no two podcasts are alike. A lot of people think of one specific thing when they hear the word podcast, and it's usually related to the first type of podcast they encountered. However, podcasts are just as varied as books and TV, maybe even more, because it's a lot easier to publish a podcast than it is to get a book published, and way easier to publish a podcast than it is to get a TV show off the ground. I have assembled a collection here of eight popular shows for you, and each one fits into its own different, very popular genre. My favorite murder is a true crime, where a pair of comedians talk about their historical favorite historical murder cases. Mabim Bam is a comedy advice show where the McElroys give bad advice to their listeners. Welcome to Night Vale is an ongoing fiction series about a small, strange desert town. Science Versus is an educational program that does fact-checking and deep dives on current events and other popular topics. No Sleep is another kind of fiction. It's a horror anthology. This American Life is a long-running public radio show that shares essays, memoirs, and short fiction on a specific topic each week. Friends at the Table is an actual play, which means it uses RPG mechanics to tell its stories. And Office Ladies is a celebrity show. 
sorry, I shouldn't say celebrity with such disdain. Uh, A lot of celebrities make good podcasts and Office Ladies is another popular genre as well. The actresses are re-watching the show and talking about the episodes and behind the scenes stuff. So now that we have covered the ultra basics, we're going to move on under the assumption that you want to make a podcast, probably that you already have some idea of what you want to make. And the first thing you'll need is some kind of concept. Maybe you have something in mind already, maybe not, but this starting point is going to become a baseline for what potentially could be a project that lasts for years. So start by deciding on the basics. Will the show be fiction or nonfiction? Will you use a script or notes, or will it be more improvised or conversational? What skills and talents do you have to bring to the show, and what will you need help on? For setting goals, avoid the impulse to think about numbers or about money. Start on the assumption that you'll be able to build a small audience and that you will make no money but will love what you do. If you find yourself with a hit, then you can think about monetizing after. Instead, you'll want to think about questions like, who do you want your audience to be? And what do you want the show to be for them? For example, if you want to make an educational show, who do you want to teach? And how do you want to convince them that the thing you're teaching is worth their time? If you want to make a show with gaming, do you want it to be dramatic or funny or cozy? Do you want to get political? These sort of questions will guide you in every step moving forward from designing your logo and the show's format to how you market it and whose attention you try and get. Finally, you want to look around and see who else is making something centered around your concept. You can search on Podchaser or even on social media and see who else is making shows like yours. This will give you a good idea of what has and has not been done or hasn't gotten the attention it deserves. You can see if there's like a little niche your show can fit itself into, something you're passionate about that people have discussed but never really made their main focus. You'll notice that I have some big bold letters on this slide. It is very important to reframe the idea of originality when you're making a podcast, or really when you're creating anything at all. What I mean by that is, if you go out there and you find there are already a dozen or a hundred podcasts that are devoted to your topic, you shouldn't be discouraged. You need to remember that none of them have your unique perspective. So for example, my genre of choice, actual play role-playing game podcasts, there are over 300 indie podcasts listed on one website, rpgcasts.com. And yet, pretty much every new show has value to someone, and I am always looking for new perspectives to listen to. Something that may not be clear to someone who's just starting out is how flexible a podcast's format can be. Actually, Let me back up and explain what a format even is. When I say format, I am talking about all the little structural details that influence the way a show flows. The length of an episode, its content and how it's organized, the number of speakers and how they interact, whether you're going to include cursing or other explicit content, and how often episodes are released. I included some common formats here, and you're probably familiar with at least one of them. Comedy chat shows usually have two or three hosts and include a series of segments to guide the conversation, but mostly it's just freely improvised conversation. They typically publish every week, forever. At the other end of the spectrum, you'll find audio drama, which is fully scripted and usually includes a voice actor for every character. Episode length depends on the story, but it can be very short. In addition, they tend to be released in seasons, or even just a short run of 10 or 20 episodes, and then they're done forever. Long story short, every type of show has some sort of structure associated with it, so you need to think about yours. You can probably get the idea from these notes that there are a lot of ways to do your format, and there are a lot of decisions to be made, but the good thing is you don't necessarily have to make them all right at the beginning. 
especially if you're doing the sort of show where you release something every single week for an indefinite period of time, you can expect it to evolve with your needs. Your format may change over time alongside your process, your interests, and what your listeners need from you. Drawing on my list of popular podcasts from before, let's look at how the show My Brother, My Brother and Me has changed over time. The core purpose of the show, three brothers giving bad advice, has been constant, but over time they've made a lot of changes to keep things fresh. They've changed their theme song and their logo at different points in time, and they try out new segments like Munch Squad, where Justin talks about silly fast food press releases. The good segments stick, and the bad ones, hopefully, fade away. My big point to make about format is that a longer show is not necessarily a better show. A lot of us have had the idea drilled into our heads that something has to be a certain length to be good or to be worthy. Your papers at school are marked down for being too short, even if the logic and the writing are solid. People disregard shorter books for not being serious enough. And so you probably already know that long doesn't automatically mean good. We all saw what happens when you try and turn The Hobbit into a trilogy. If you can't consistently fill an hour with something that makes you proud, you can do a half hour show or a 20 minute show. I used to listen to a podcast called A Thousand Things to Talk About, which was under five minutes daily. Episodes of my audio drama interference range from about eight minutes to 20 minutes. If you have a story to tell or a lesson to teach, don't try and force it into a time slot that feels uncomfortable. By the same token, if you're making a show and you feel like your material has gotten stale, there's no rule that says you have to keep making it. Bring it to an end and leave it as a testament to a big project that you finished. I have one final point about format. In our region, Southern New England specifically, we kind of don't give a we don't really care about foul language. It's part of the flow of speech for a lot of people here, myself included. But there are places in this country and in the world at large where that is definitely not true. So consider your audience carefully when you decide whether you'll allow your host to swear on the show. If any episodes of your show have the explicit tag for language, you're cutting out a chunk of your potential audience. I pretty much always keep the cursing in because it's part of the ambiance, but keep it in mind. Moving beyond format, the next thing you need to consider in the pre-production phase is your cast or the people you're going to have on your show. The cast of a podcast can look like anything from you hunched alone in your closet, murmuring into a microphone in the glow of your laptop to a large group of actors working in a studio or remotely to record a traditional script. Each way of creating has its own pros and cons. If you make a show alone, you can be your own boss. And creators learn pretty fast that it's hard to be your own boss. If you want to work solo, you need to really know what motivates you to keep going, whether it's deadlines or getting feedback from friends or even giving yourself small rewards for milestones. If you make a show with a friend or a small friend group, there are people there who are going to pick up the slack if you're having an off day and remind you of things, but really just having other people involved gives you a reason to keep going, even if they don't actively remind you or encourage you. You don't want to let them down. But on the other hand, working with close friends on creative projects can lead to fights if you disagree on what the show should be or something else. It's important to lay out at the beginning what your priorities are, and let me tell you from experience, the priority should be the friendship, not the show. If you take on a producer role and you work with a large cast with guest stars or you put out a casting call, that removes the danger of working with friends. But it also means that in a way, you're somebody else's boss. Even if everyone you work with is a volunteer, you're in charge, and that's a lot of responsibility that might not always be fun. The final point that I need to make in pre-production is that you need a logo. I'm not saying that in a wishy-washy, you should have a logo to build your brand and catch people's eyes sort of way. In order to release a podcast on any platform, you're required to have art to display in search listings and on podcatchers. 
it needs to be square and the size should be at least 1500 by 1500 pixels. I'm not going to get into the history of why you just need it. If you're an artist, you probably don't need my help here. But if you're not, it is really easy these days to make your own graphics for free. You can use whatever sort of service you like, but I am currently a big fan of Canva. You can click create a design and choose a custom size of 1500 by 1500 pixels. And then there's lots of open source photographs, graphics, and really lovely fonts that you can use to make your cover art. I made a couple of different examples for a fake podcast. They are both terrible, um, but one is worse than the other. You want your logo to be immediately recognizable, readable, and understandable. So the first one here on the left, you can barely read the text and there's a lot of wasted space. So bad, don't do that. The second one, you may think it's ugly, but you do know that it is Catherine's awesome podcast and that it's probably about alligators. Ideally, you will make yourself a graphic that is beautiful as well as understandable, but if you follow those rules, you'll at least have something that's useful. If you can't make your own logo, you can work with an artist. I know this class is going up to teenagers, so you have extremely limited resources, but I cannot stress this enough. Artists should be paid for their work. Logo design is not easy. If you work with an artist, whether or not you know them personally, go into the discussion about it, assuming that you're going to pay them somehow with money, with a trade, just pay them with something. Friends, don't ask friends for free art. This is probably something a lot of you have been waiting for. To make a show, you need equipment. And yes, it's easy to spend a lot of money on equipment. But I'm here to tell you that to get started, you probably already have what you need. You don't need to go out and get a fancy microphone and buy software and all that. You can. And if you have the resources upgrading your microphone to whatever level makes you happy with your sound, it's, it's a good investment. But a huge part of the allure of podcasting is being able to do it on the cheap. So in this section, I'm not going to give you a broad idea of podcast equipment. I'm going to start by talking about the kind of equipment I use on my shows, which I produce on a very small budget. And then I'm going to show off the equipment that we have available to borrow from the library, which can give you access to a slightly better setup free of charge. So... While there is a huge world of audio equipment out there, you only really need a few things. A mic, a place to record, headphones, and a computer to store your files. You don't need an expensive mic to get good sound. You can use the built-in mic for your phone or laptop, whatever sort of headset you use for school or to game with your friends. That's totally fine too, especially when you're first starting. When we make our show, Novel Tea, at the North Situate Library, Miss Elise records directly into her phone's built-in mic, and I can play a sample of her voice from the show. Hi everyone, this is Miss Elise here to give you a quick update on what's happening for children and teens here at the library. Sounds pretty good, right? I use a blue snowball mic. It's the first one that I bought back in 2017, after upgrading from a gaming headset. It's a reasonably priced option that connects to a computer with a USB cable. It's universal, plug and play, and I've never had a problem with it. I've dropped it a few times with no ill effects, not that I recommend that. And you can get one of them for $40 if you wait for a sale and it'll last you a lifetime. This isn't an advertisement for blue microphones. There's lots of inexpensive USB microphones out there for you. Um, next is your recording space. The only requirement here is that it needs to be quiet. I know that sometimes a quiet room can be very hard to find, but it's probably the most important element of all of this. When you're recording audio, anything in your environment has a habit of showing up when you play it back. A noisy air conditioner, your neighbor's dog, loud family members who don't care about your need for silence. All of that has to be removed later when you're editing. So if you find a quiet time and place to record, that'll save you a lot of time later. A lot of people like to record in their clothes closet. It's quiet and there's a lot of clothing around to prevent the noise from echoing. 
I personally have never done that, but the logic is very sound. If the only place you can find quiet is the closet, push the shoes out of the way and drag your mic in there. Uh, headphones. A lot of people have big opinions on headphones, and I am not one of those people. You need some, so you can hear your co-hosts and the guests when you connect, and they can help a lot in the editing process, but cheap earbuds or whatever you have, that's fine. The last thing you need is a computer of some sort. I'm going to talk a little more about secret podcasting costs later, but suffice it to say, anything that has a few gigabytes of storage and can connect to the internet will work for you. If you have a complicated edit, you'll want to work either on a tablet for the bigger screen or any computer that has a mouse to simplify navigating, but a phone is acceptable. Um, my computer is reasonably nice because my wife is a PC gamer and... I don't have a gaming rig, but I do have all her old cast-offs that are sort of jammed together in a case. But you don't need anything that powerful. A Chromebook or whatever sort of workstation people use in offices, that's totally fine. Uh, it's really just there for internet access and file storage. Uh, so how the library can help you. Um, we just got a new podcasting kit, and it includes the exact mic that I mentioned, the Blue Snowball USB mic. Um, and we also have some adapters, USB to mini USB, so you can plug it into your phone or tablet if that's what you're using. We don't have an Apple adapter, but if you're working with an iPad, you probably don't need the accessories. It comes with a pop filter that you can use to reduce harsh sounds in your mic as well. Um, I don't use one, but I'm sloppy. We also have a decent pair of over-ear noise-canceling headphones. I'm pretty sure that the picture on my slide is exactly what we're loaning out. Um, and we have a portable acoustic foam shield, so that if your quiet room isn't as quiet as you like, you can use the shields around your mic so that it doesn't hear anything that isn't directly in front of it. So, if you borrow our kit, you really just need the device. The last thing that you do kind of need that I'm considering equipment, even though it's not physical equipment, is audio recording and editing software. I'm not an Apple person, but Apple tends to have good creation tools in general. The go-to for a lot of audio editors on Apple devices is called GarageBand. It's free to use, and it also has a lot of music creation tools if you want to create your own music for the show. If you have a mobile device, there are a lot of free apps available. I'm including a link to an article with five choices that you can explore for Android devices on the resources page. And if you're working on a PC, you want to use Audacity. Remember how I said I wasn't advertising for blue microphones? I absolutely 100,000% endorse Audacity here. There are people who disagree with me on this, but I have been using this program for like 15 years, and I love it. It is powerful and flexible and free, and it can handle as many tracks as you need if you have a lot of people, uh, and you can record right into it has a lot of features that you can mess around with and learn, um, and it's very easy to cut audio together. It's the best piece of software out there for audio hobbyists. If you end up making a career out of podcasting, you'll want to look into a program like Reaper, but right now, try Audacity. A little while back, I mentioned secret costs, and I have a lot of thoughts about exactly how much it costs to podcast. Most of them are about the way we value our time. However, what I'm talking about right here are real monetary costs, and that is the cost of storage space. It may not be immediately obvious, but the audio that you're going to be recording requires a lot of space to store it. We're just going to look at this puppy while I talk about it. Depending on how you work, you may not want to keep your old files around. Once you upload the show, maybe you're happy deleting that file and letting the only record of it be on your host. If that's the case, no worries. However, if you want to keep your original file, or more than that, if you want to keep all of your raw audio files, you're going to need a lot of space. And if you podcast for a long time, you'll eventually need to buy some. For example, the final cut of the June episode of Novelty with the North Situate Library is an MP3, and it is 17 megabytes or 0.17 gigs. And that's not bad. 
However, the raw recordings are another tenth of a gig, and the Audacity file where I put everything together and that I like to keep around because I can make quick edits if I find a mistake, that's another quarter of a gig. So that's half a gigabyte of storage per episode for a 20 minute long show. So yeah, storage is a secret killer. And at some point, you'll need to sacrifice some of your backup files or buy an external hard drive or buy cloud storage. I use Dropbox to store my podcasts, and it's basically necessary at this point because I have 250 gigabytes of podcast files stored. Probably no one needs to be doing that, but it is very hard to make cuts once you have a system in place. If you're just getting started, this is what I recommend. Start a brand new, fresh, shiny Gmail account for your show. Something that you can use to let people email you questions and comments. They won't, but it's nice to have. Uh, And along with that, you'll get 15 gigabytes of free file storage through Google Drive. You can keep your stuff in that account, tucked away nice and safe online. And if you reach that 15 gigabyte limit, you can make your decisions on what you really want to keep. So... At this point, we have a good idea of what we're doing. We have a great idea for a podcast. We have a bunch of guests lined up and we know how we want the show to flow and what sort of segments to include, how long it's going to be, how we feel about explicit language. We have a logo and we have all of our recording equipment ready. It's time to record. When people think about podcasting, the thing that makes them nervous is recording. But I promise you, recording really is the easy part. So in basic terms, to record, you need to get together with your friends, click record, do whatever your podcast is about, click stop, and save everything to edit later. But most of those steps have a lot of factors. For example, how are you going to meet, virtually or in person? Either way has pros and cons. Is one person going to be in charge of recording, or is everyone going to record their own voice and then send it to the editor? What sort of file should they be saving? And there's not really a wrong way to do it, as long as you can make it work, turn it into a podcast. But in this section, I'm going to share my super fantastic actual play podcast recording methodology with you, Um, and it will work with any situation where you're recording more than one person's voice. So I recommend that you meet virtually. My first podcast was Roll Like a Girl, and we met virtually because we had to. I'm here in Rhode Island, and we had players in Arkansas, Texas, and Florida. We didn't think about it. It was just a necessity. If we were going to play together, we had to meet online. My second actual play show, we recorded for a long time at one table, and I learned how good we had it in our lag. Every mic bump, every cough, every creaky chair, it affected every voice at the table rather than just whoever had done it. It's much harder to edit something like that. Your quality is going to automatically take a hit before you've even started. The main thing you need to know about getting good audio quality is that you need to start with something good. Editing can only get you so far. Virtual meetings make that easier. We use Discord voice chat, uh, but you can use Zoom, Skype, Google, or any other voice chat that you and your hosts are comfy with. Some people like video chat. I like just audio because I don't want to have to look presentable, and everyone has their own workflow. Next, it is a good idea, a great idea, let's say, to have a backup recording. Most voice chat services have a way to record the conversation built in. In Discord, we use a bot called Craig, who records all the different voices in the chat and then lets you download them. Zoom allows you to record, and if you have access to a paid account, you can get all the vocal tracks separate there as well. Use those. However, I strongly recommend that each person also records their own audio on their own device in Audacity or another kind of recording software. That is your primary recording, and it will have the best quality. Craig and Zoom are important because they give you a backup in case someone's computer crashes or they forget to click record or something just sounded wrong or because some other tech gremlin happened. Um, At that point, you can fall on your backup. The reason I recommend the automatic recordings as a backup 
is because they record the call the way that it sounded online. The quality depends on your internet connection. And we've all had those weird robot voice chats at this point. Uh, it's, it's what Zoom records um, if you use that. So even if that's happening to somebody on your call, the audio that they're recording directly into their computer will be accurate and free of buffering problems. The next thing is to sync your audio files. If you've taken that advice and you're all recording your own audio, you need a way for your editor to line it all up. One of the easiest ways is to have somebody count down from three and then on zero have everyone clap like this. Three, two, one. That creates a big spike in the audio file um, that's recognizable visually and it's a good sound as well. Uh, you can also snap your fingers, shout the word sync, or just about anything that you can all consistently do at exactly the same time. Then when your editor is editing, it's very clear where everything lines up, even if you didn't all start or end your file at the same time. The next step is to do the podcast. Um, and there's not much I can help you with here. Ideally, at this point, you'll all just forget about the technology involved and you can have a good time chatting or playing your game or going through your script. Uh, the final, I believe, final step will be to export. The details of the files you have are not that important, uh, but you do want to make sure that everything is the same. When you're done, you'll want to export your audio using exactly the same parameters as everybody else. In their final form, podcasts are usually 96 kilobit per second MP3 files. However, for your raw recordings, you may want to save as a WAV file. Waves are a lot bigger, but they are also lossless. So every time you edit an MP3, there's a little bit of data that gets just lost and you never get it back. Um, your sound quality gets a little bit worse every time you edit an MP3, but a WAV, that doesn't happen. One more small thing about exporting is that you should make sure that people give their files a good name so you don't have to open it up to figure out what it is. So I like to have people put it their name or if they're playing a character, the character's name and the episode number for the podcast. Once you have all your files, all that's left is editing and publishing. Me saying that like editing isn't a bunch of work is a joke. When it comes to editing, you're going to have to get familiar with your software. This presentation can't be about editing because it's already getting long. And I could talk again for this long just about my editing process and audacity and how it's changed over the years and the little tricks that I've learned. So I'm just going to give you the ultra basics. Every podcast will need a different method applied to it when it comes to editing because the show determines what you need. If you have a conversational show or some sort of scripted nonfiction like novelty, all you'll have to do is go through and listen, cut out any time there was a mistake, and remove some of the ums and uhs and tongue clicks and sneezes. <laughs> Anything that makes you sound bad, really cut it out. It's important to leave some ums and uhs in so that you don't sound like robots, but cut out anything that's isolated. Especially if you're making scripted audio fiction, you'll be doing what they call dialogue editing. You'll pull your various audio files together, listen to multiple takes in the same lines and decide which ones are the best. And then you'll have a lot of control over timing. Then there's full on sound design. It includes all those other things. Plus you can add music, sound effects, and really control the show's vibes. Pretty much any show will have some elements of all of these things. If you have a comedy chat show, you may occasionally want to alter the timing on a joke to make it land harder, which falls into the dialogue editing category. Pretty much any show can use music, especially at the opening and closing. You can do as much or as little editing as you want. The goal should be to make everyone sound as good as possible without spending so much time on it that you don't have fun anymore. One quick note. Um, after you're done editing your show, I seriously recommend running it through a little program called Levelator, which is another reason to use WAV files because that's what Levelator requires. Processing audio through Levelator is basically the cheater's way of leveling and equalizing your audio. So in not technical terms, what that means is all the voices in your show will be the same volume, sound nice and crisp, and they'll be the right volume. 
When I started using Levelator, the improvement was even more significant than when I started using a better mic. There's a link in the resources at the end of this document. Um, the site for Levelator looks like it's old and maybe dead and maybe a little creepy. Uh, they don't update the product anymore, but I promise you it is not going to hurt your computer and it is the single best tool that I have in my arsenal. Once you have your episode edited, how do you publish them? Well, if you have a website, you can do it directly using a blog feed. Squarespace has a really simple way to do that, and most blogging platforms are similar. If you don't, and most people don't, you need to find a host, and generally that costs money. To get around the money issue, a lot of people recommend Anchor. Anchor is a free podcast hosting service run by Spotify. As a librarian who has a lot of big thoughts about copyright and who owns art, I feel uncomfortable recommending it. Anchor's original terms of service gave them transferable rights over their users' content perpetually. That means that by uploading to their service, they basically took ownership of your show and had the right to give it to somebody else if they wanted to. Their terms have changed since then, but whew, I am still very wary of that. If you decide to use Anchor or any service that's offering to host anything on the web for you for free, keep an, a very, very close eye on their terms of service. Your privacy and your intellectual property are important. If you are able to spend some money on it, there are a lot of services out there that host podcasts for a monthly fee, ranging from $5 to $20 a month, with all sorts of different features available. Some of them let you record right into the service and edit your show online. Do your research and figure out what you can use. In my experience, a good low-budget option is Pinecast. The thing that sets them apart from a lot of other services is that $5 a month fee allows you to make as many separate feeds as you want. I host seven different shows for $5 a month in total. So if you and a big group of friends want to pool your resources for all your podcasts, congratulations, you're a podcast network now, and you can get one Pinecast account for all your shows. Unify and seize the means of the podcast. So you have a show now, and it's time to make sure that somebody actually hears it. Uh, for anyone watching this who isn't a teenager, I apologize for this section because teens, I know that you know social media and how to build a brand and present yourself better than me. So I'm going to give you the briefest overview of the podcast marketing scene. The first thing is podcasts don't go viral. If you can figure out how to make your show viral, then let me know. But <laughs> what they do really well is build loyal listeners slowly. And there are a lot of ways that you can encourage it to happen. It's pretty important to be active on social media. Like, yes, you should post links when you have a new episode, but you should also be posting random thoughts and memes and boosting other people's work and fundraisers and talking to people. It might actually be easiest to market your podcast from a personal account rather than making a specific one for the show. Another important thing is to just be nice to people. Your biggest audience, especially at first, is going to be other podcasters. If you spend a lot of time on Twitter leaving positive reviews of indie podcasts, those people are going to remember you, and they'll be more willing to try out your show and leave their own reviews. Along the same line, the best thing that you can do is get involved in a podcasting community of some kind. I've made some of my best friends through podcasting, and it started by just listening to their stuff and hanging out with them on Discord. The nice part is crucial. If you join a community and treat people badly, they're going to remember that too. I promise. Once you are in a community of some kind, you can offer a promo swap. You can make a one minute long ad for your show and ask people to run it at the end of their shows, and then you can do the same for them in return. That helps you share listeners with each other's audiences, and it can bring your show to a new group of people. Another way to get your show seen by a lot of podcast fans is to have a podcast reviewer write a review of your show on their blog. A lot of reviewers have open reviews, you just have to request it, but it's important to note that they all have guidelines. So don't send your nonfiction shows to people who only review fiction and vice versa. Don't send things when their inbox isn't open and generally be polite and do exactly what they request. My final note for marketing is that one of the best things you can do in podcasting is be available to your listeners. 
talk to them on social media or on Discord, do Q&As, or just answer questions about the show when they have them, and participate in the sort of things that they do. But it's very, very important to have boundaries in these situations. When you listen to a podcast, you learn a lot about the host, and you feel some sort of closeness to them. But that's manufactured. It's something we talked about manufacturing earlier. Um, So just be careful with listeners who think that they're your friend just because they listen to your show. And even with all that, the best marketing tool for your show is always going to be the show itself. Podcasting is basically the best way to take your weird little idea, throw it out into the internet and have it find exactly the type of people who need to listen to it. Try weird stuff, hone your craft and keep making better podcasts. And really, I say, as though I haven't blabbed at you for almost an hour, that's all I can tell you about podcasting. Okay, so that's the class, but remember that on July 21st at 3 p.m., I'm hosting a Q&A about podcasting and everything I discussed here. The link will be in the description. Drop by and say hello and tell me about all of your podcast ideas. Like, seriously, consider me your podcast aunt now. If you have a great concept or you just want me to listen to your show or something that you're working on, you can send me an email at katherine at situatelibrary.org and I absolutely will listen. I'll even leave you a good review. I love podcasts and I'm authentically interested in hearing what you make. See ya! <laughs>